For thousands of years, people have been trying to understand their relationship to the rest of the universe. For a variety of reasons, many philosophers today are reluctant to tackle such big problems. Nonetheless, the problems remain, and in these lectures I'm going to attack some of them. At the moment, the biggest problem is this. We have a certain common sense picture of ourselves as human beings, which is very hard to square with our overall scientific conception of the physical world. We think of ourselves as conscious, free, mindful, rational agents in a world that science tells us consists entirely of mindless, meaningless, physical particles. Now, how can we square these two conceptions? How, for example, can it be both the case that the world contains nothing but unconscious physical particles, and yet it also contains consciousness? How can a mechanical universe contain intentionalistic human beings, human beings that can represent the world to themselves? How can an essentially meaningless world contain meanings? Such problems also spill over into other more contemporary sounding issues. How shall we interpret recent work in computer science and artificial intelligence, work aimed at making intelligent machines? Specifically, does the digital computer at last give us the right picture of the human mind? And why is it that the social sciences in general have not given us insights into ourselves comparable to those that the natural sciences have given us into the rest of nature? In this first lecture, I want to plunge right into what many philosophers think of as the hardest problem of all. What's the relation of our minds to the rest of the universe? This, I'm sure you'll recognize, is the traditional mind-body or mind-brain problem. In its contemporary version, it usually takes the form, how does the mind relate to the brain? I believe that the mind-body problem has a rather simple solution one that's consistent both with what we know about neurophysiology and with our common sense conception of the nature of our mental states, pains, beliefs, desires, and so on. But before presenting that solution, I want to ask, why does the mind-body problem seem so intractable? Why do we still have in philosophy and psychology after all these centuries a mind-body problem in a way that we do not have, say, a digestion-stomach problem? Why does the mind seem more mysterious to us than other biological phenomena? I'm convinced that part of the difficulty is that we persist in talking about a 20th century problem in an outmoded 17th century vocabulary. When I was an undergraduate, I remember being dissatisfied with the choices that were apparently available in the philosophy of mind. You could be either a monist or a dualist. If you were a monist, you could be either a materialist or an idealist. If a materialist, you could be either a behaviorist or a physicalist, and so on. One of my aims in what follows is to try to break out of these tired categories. But vocabulary apart, there is still a problem or family of problems. Since Descartes, the mind-body problem has taken the following form. How can we account for the relationships between two apparently completely different kinds of things? On the one hand, there are mental things, such as our thoughts and feelings, and we think of them as subjective, conscious, and immaterial. On the other hand, there are physical things, and we think of them as having mass as extended in space and as causally interacting with other physical things. Most attempted solutions to the mind-body problem wind up by denying the existence of, or in some way downgrading the status of, one or the other of these types of things. Given the successes of the physical sciences, it's not surprising that in our stage of intellectual development, the temptation is to downgrade the status of mental entities. Most of the recently fashionable materialist conceptions of the mind, such as behaviorism, functionalism, and physicalism, end up by denying, implicitly or explicitly, that there are any such things as minds as we ordinarily think of them. That is, they deny that we really do intrinsically have subjective conscious mental states that are as real as anything else in the universe. Now, why do they do that? Why is it that so many theorists end up by denying the intrinsically mental character of mental phenomena? If we can answer that question, I believe that we will understand why the mind-body problem has seemed so intractable for so long. There are four features of mental phenomena which have made them seem impossible to fit into our scientific conception of the world as made up of material things. 
It is these four features that have made the mind-body problem really difficult. The first and most important of these features is consciousness. I, at the moment of saying this, and you at the moment of hearing it, are both conscious. It's just a plain fact about the world that it contains such conscious mental states and events, but it's hard to see how mere physical systems could have consciousness. How could such a thing occur? How, for example, could this gray and white gook inside my skull be conscious? I think the existence of consciousness ought to seem amazing to us. Consciousness is the central fact of specifically human existence because without it, all of the other specifically human aspects of our existence, such as language, love, humor, and so on, would be impossible. I believe it is, by the way, something of a scandal that contemporary discussions in philosophy and psychology have so little of interest to tell us about consciousness. The second intractable feature of the mind is what philosophers and psychologists call intentionality, the feature by which our mental states are directed at or about or refer to or are of objects and states of affairs in the world other than themselves. Intentionality, by the way, doesn't just refer to intentions, but also to beliefs, desires, hopes, fears, love, hate, lust, disgust, shame, pride, irritation, amusement, and all of those mental states, whether conscious or unconscious, that refer to or are about the world apart from the mind. Now, the question about intentionality is much like the question about consciousness. How can this stuff inside my head be about anything? How can it refer to anything? After all, the stuff in the skull consists of atoms in the void, just as all the rest of material reality consists of atoms in the void. How, to put it crudely, can atoms in the void represent anything? The third feature of the mind that seems difficult to accommodate within a scientific conception of reality is the subjectivity of mental states. This subjectivity is marked by such facts as that I can feel my pains and you can't. I see the world from my point of view, you see it from your point of view. I am aware of myself and my internal mental states as quite distinct from the selves and mental states of other people. Since the 17th century, we've come to think of reality as something which must be equally accessible to all competent observers. That is, we think it must be objective. Now, how are we to accommodate the reality of subjective mental phenomena with the scientific conception of reality as totally objective? Finally, there's a fourth problem, the problem of mental causation. We all suppose, as part of common sense, that our thoughts and feelings make a difference to the way we behave, that they actually have some causal effect on the physical world. I decide, for example, to raise my arm, and, lo and behold, my arm goes up. But if our thoughts and feelings are truly mental, how can they affect anything physical? Are we supposed to think that our thoughts and feelings can somehow produce chemical effects on our brains and the rest of our nervous system? Do we suppose that the thought can wrap itself around the axons and the dendrites, or that it can sneak inside the cell wall and attack the cell nucleus? How could such things possibly occur? But unless some such connection takes place between the mind and the brain, aren't we left with a view that the mind doesn't matter, that it is as unimportant causally as the froth on the wave is to the movement of the wave? If the froth were conscious, it might think to itself, what a tough job it is pulling these waves up on the beach and then pulling them out again all day long. But we know that the froth doesn't make any important difference. Now, why do we suppose our mental life is any more important than a froth on the wave of physical reality. These four features then, consciousness, intentionality, subjectivity, and mental causation, are what make the mind-body problem seem so difficult. Yet I wish to say, they're all real features of our mental lives. Not every mental state has all of them, but any satisfactory account of the mind and of mind-body relations must take account of all four features. If your theory ends up by denying any one of them, you know you must have made a mistake somewhere.
The first thesis I want to advance toward solving the mind-body problem is this. Mental phenomena, all mental phenomena, whether conscious or unconscious, visual or auditory, pains, tickles, itches, thoughts, indeed all of our mental life, are caused by processes going on in the brain. For example, let's consider pains. Of course, anything we say now may seem wonderfully quaint in a generation or so as our knowledge of how the brain works increases. Nonetheless, the form of the explanation can remain valid, even though the details are altered. On current views, pain signals are transmitted from sensory nerve endings to the spinal cord by at least two types of fibers, delta A fibers, which are specialized for prickling sensations, and C fibers, which are specialized for burning and aching sensations. As the signals go up the spine, they enter the brain by two separate pathways, the prickling pain pathway and the burning pain pathway. Both pathways go through the thalamus, but the prickling pain pathway is more localized afterwards in the somatosensory cortex, whereas the burning pain pathway transmits signals not only upwards into the cortex, but also laterally into the hypothalamus and other regions at the base of the brain. Now, for the purposes of this discussion, the point we need to hammer home is this. Our sensations of pains are caused by a series of events that begin at free nerve endings and end in the thalamus and in other regions of the brain. And indeed, as far as the actual sensations are concerned, the events inside the central nervous system are quite sufficient to cause pains, as we know both from the phantom limb pains felt by amputees and the pains caused by artificially stimulating relevant portions of the brain. And I want to suggest that what is true of pain is true of mental phenomena generally. To put it crudely, and counting all of the central nervous system as part of the brain for our present discussion, everything that matters for our mental life all of our thoughts and feelings are caused by processes inside the brain. The crucial step is the one that goes on inside the head, not the external or peripheral stimulus. And the argument for this is simple. If the events outside the central nervous system occurred, but nothing happened in the brain, there would be no mental events. But if the right things happened in the brain, the mental events would occur even if there was no outside stimulus. But if pains and other mental phenomena are caused by processes in the brain, one wants to know, well, what are pains? What are they really? In the case of pains, the obvious answer is that they are unpleasant sorts of sensations. But that answer leaves us unsatisfied because it doesn't tell us how pains fit into our overall conception of the world. Once again, I think the answer to the question is obvious, but it will take some spelling out. To our first claim, pains and other mental phenomena are caused by brain processes, we need to add a second claim. Pains and other mental phenomena are features of the brain and perhaps the rest of the central nervous system. Now, one of the primary aims of this lecture is to show how both of these propositions can be true together. How can it be both the case that brains cause minds and yet minds just are features of brains? If mental and physical phenomena have cause and effect relationships, how can one be a feature of the other? Wouldn't that imply that the mind caused itself, the dreaded doctrine of causa sui? But at the bottom of our puzzlement is a misunderstanding of causation. It's tempting to think that whenever A causes B, there must be two discrete events, one identified as the cause, the other identified as the effect that all causation functions in the same way as billiard balls hitting each other. This crude model of the causal relationships between the brain and the mind inclines us to accept some kind of dualism, that events in one material realm, the physical, cause events in another insubstantial realm, the mental. But that seems to me a mistake. And the way to remove the mistake is to get a more sophisticated concept of causation. To do this, I want to turn away from the relationships between mind and brain for a moment to observe some other sorts of causal relationships in nature. 
A common distinction in physics is between micro and macro properties of systems, the small and large scales. Consider, for example, the desk at which I'm now sitting or the glass of water in front of me. Each object is composed of microparticles. The microparticles have features at the level of molecules and atoms as well as at the deeper level of subatomic particles. But each object also has certain properties such as the solidity of the table, the liquidity of the water, and the transparency of the glass, which are surface or global properties of the physical systems. Many such surface or global properties can be causally explained by the behavior of elements at the micro level. For example, the solidity of the table in front of me is explained by the lattice structure occupied by the molecules of which the table is composed. Similarly, the liquidity of the water is explained by the nature of the interactions between the H2O molecules. Now, it seems to me that these rather banal examples provide a perfectly ordinary model for explaining the puzzling relationships between the mind and the brain. In the case of liquidity, solidity, and transparency, we have no difficulty at all in saying that the surface features are caused by the behavior of elements at the micro level. At the same time, we accept that the surface phenomena just are features of the systems in question. The clearest way I know of stating this point is to say that the surface feature is caused by the behavior of microelements and at the same time is realized in the system that's made up of the microelements. There is indeed a cause and effect relationship, but at the same time, the surface features are just higher level features of the very system whose behavior at the micro level causes them. Now, in objecting to this, one might say that liquidity, solidity, and so on are really identical with features of the microstructure. So, for example, we might just define solidity as the lattice structure of the molecular arrangement. Well, this point seems to me correct, but not really an objection to the analysis that I'm proposing. It's a characteristic of the progress of science that an expression that's originally defined in terms of surface features, features accessible to the senses, is subsequently defined in terms of the microstructure that causes the surface features. Thus, to take the example of solidity, the table in front of me is solid in the ordinary sense that it's rigid, it resists pressure, it supports books, it's not easily penetrable by most other objects such as other tables, and so on. Such is the common sense notion of solidity. And in a scientific vein, one can then define solidity as whatever microstructure causes these gross observable features. One can then say either that solidity just is the lattice structure of the system of molecules and that solidity so defined causes, for example, resistance to touch and pressure. Or one can say that solidity consists of such higher level things as rigidity and resistance to touch and pressure and is caused by the behavior of elements at the micro level. Now, if we apply these lessons to the study of the mind, it seems to me there's no difficulty in accounting for the relations of the mind to the brain in terms of the brain's functioning to cause mental states. Just as the liquidity of the water is caused by the behavior of elements at the micro level, and yet at the same time is a feature realized in the system of microelements, so in exactly that sense of caused by and realized in, mental phenomena are caused by processes going on in the brain at the neuronal or modular level, and they are realized in the very system that consists of neurons. And just as we need the micro-macro distinction for any physical system, for the same reasons, we need the micro-macro distinction for the brain. Though we can say of a system of particles that it's 10 degrees centigrade or solid or liquid, we can't say of any given particle that this particle is solid, this particle is liquid, this particle is 10 degrees centigrade. I can't reach into this glass, pull out a molecule, and say, this one's wet. Now, in exactly the same way, as far as we know anything at all about it, Though we can say of a particular brain, this brain is conscious or this brain is experiencing thirst or pain, we cannot say of any particular neuron, this neuron is in pain, this neuron is experiencing thirst. To repeat this point, though there are enormous empirical mysteries about how the brain works in detail, 
there are no logical or philosophical or metaphysical obstacles to accounting for the relation between the mind and the brain in terms that are completely familiar to us from the rest of nature. Well, let's now return to the four problems that seem to face any attempt to solve the mind-brain problem. First, how is consciousness possible? The best way to show how something is possible is to show how it actually exists. We've already given a sketch of how pains are actually caused by neurophysiological processes going on in the thalamus and the sensory cortex. Why is it then that many people feel dissatisfied with this sort of an answer? I think that by pursuing an analogy with an earlier problem in the history of science, we can dispel this sense of puzzlement. For a long time, many biologists and philosophers thought it was impossible in principle to account for the existence of life on purely biological grounds. They thought that in addition to the biological processes, some other element must be necessary. Some élan vital must be postulated in order to lend life to what was otherwise just dead and inert matter. It's hard today to realize how intense the dispute was between vitalists and mechanists even a generation ago. But today these issues are no longer taken seriously. Why not? I think it's not so much because mechanism won and vitalism lost, but because we've come to understand better the biological character of the processes that are characteristic of living organisms. Once we understand how the features have a biological explanation, it no longer seems mysterious to us that matter should be alive. And I suggest that exactly similar considerations should apply to our discussions of consciousness. It should seem no more mysterious in principle that this hunk of matter this gray and white oatmeal textured substance of the brain should be conscious, then it seems to us mysterious that this other hunk of matter, this collection of nucleoprotein molecules stuck onto a calcium frame, should be alive. The way in short to dispel the mystery is to understand the processes. We don't yet fully understand the processes, but we do understand their general character we understand that there are certain specific electrochemical activities going on among neurons or neuron modules and perhaps other features of the brain, and that these processes cause consciousness. Our second problem, how can atoms in the void have intentionality? How can they be about something? As with our first question, the best way to show how something is possible is to show how it actually exists. Consider thirst. As far as we know anything about it, at least certain kinds of thirst are caused in the hypothalamus by sequences of nerve firings. These firings are in turn caused by the action of angiotensin in the hypothalamus, and angiotensin in turn is synthesized by renin, which is secreted by the kidneys. Thirst, at least of these kinds, is caused by a series of events in the central nervous system, principally the hypothalamus, and is realized in the hypothalamus. Now, to be thirsty is to have, among other things, the desire to drink. Thirst is therefore an intentional state. It has content, its content determines under what conditions it's satisfied, and it has all the rest of the features that are common to intentional states. As with the mysteries of life and consciousness, the way to master the mystery of intentionality is to describe in as much detail as we can how the phenomena are caused by biological processes while being at the same time realized in biological systems. Visual and auditory experiences, tactile sensations, hunger, thirst, and sexual desire are all caused by brain processes and realized in the structure of the brain, and they are all intentional phenomena. Third, how do we accommodate the subjectivity of mental states within an objective conception of the real world? It seems to me a mistake to suppose that the definition of reality should exclude subjectivity. If a scientific account of the world attempts to describe how things are, then one of the features of the account will be the subjectivity of mental states. Since it is just a plain fact about biological evolution, that it has produced certain sorts of biological systems, namely human and certain animal brains, 
that have subjective features. My present state of consciousness is a feature of my brain, but its conscious aspects are accessible to me in a way that they are not accessible to you. And your present state of consciousness is a feature of your brain, and its conscious aspects are accessible to you in a way that they are not accessible to me. Thus, the existence of subjectivity is an objective fact of biology. It's a persistent mistake to try to define science in terms of certain features of existing scientific theories. But once this provincialism is perceived to be the prejudice it is, then any domain of facts is a subject of systematic investigation. If, for example, God existed, then that fact would be a fact like any other. I don't know whether God exists, but I have no doubt at all that subjective mental states exist because I'm now in one and so are you. If the fact of subjectivity runs counter to a certain definition of the word science, then it's the definition and not the fact that we will have to abandon. Fourth, the problem of mental causation for our present purpose is to explain how mental events can cause physical events. How, for example, could anything as weightless, as gaseous, as ethereal, as a thought give rise to an action? Well, the answer is that thoughts are not weightless, gaseous, and ethereal. When you have a thought, brain activity is actually going on. Brain activity causes bodily movements by physiological processes. Now, because the mental states are features of the brain, they have two levels of description a higher level in mental terms and a lower level in physiological terms. The very same causal powers of the system can be described at either level. Once again, we can use an analogy from physics to illustrate these relationships. Consider hammering a nail with a hammer. Both hammer and nail have a certain kind of solidity. Hammers made of cotton wool or butter will be quite useless, and hammers made of water or steam are not hammers at all. Solidity is a real causal property of the hammer. But the solidity itself is caused by the behavior of particles at the micro level and is realized in the system of micro elements. The existence of two causally real levels of description in the brain is exactly analogous to the existence of two causally real levels of description of the hammer. Consciousness, for example, is a real property of the brain that can cause things to happen. My conscious attempt to perform an action such as raising my arm causes the movement of the arm. At the higher level of description, the intention to raise my arm causes the movement of the arm. At the lower level of description, a series of neuron firings starts a chain of events that results in the contraction of the muscles. As with the case of hammering a nail, the same sequence of events has two levels of description. Both of them are causally real, and the higher level causal features are both caused by and realized in the structure of the lower level elements. To summarize, on my view, the mind and the body interact, but they're not two different things, since mental phenomena are features of the brain. One way to characterize this solution to the mind-body problem is to see it as an assertion of both physicalism and mentalism. Suppose we define naive physicalism to be the view that all that exists in the world are physical particles with their properties and relations. The power of the physical model of reality is so great that it's hard to see how we can seriously challenge naive physicalism. And now let's define naive mentalism to be the view that mental phenomena really exist. There really are mental states. Some of them are conscious, many have intentionality, they all have subjectivity, and many of them function causally in determining physical events in the world. The thesis of this first Reith lecture can now be stated quite simply. Naive mentalism and naive physicalism are perfectly consistent with each other. Indeed, as far as we know anything about how the world works, they're not only consistent, they're both true. You've been listening to a podcast from the archives of the BBC Wreath Lectures. For more podcasts, please visit bbc.co.uk slash Radio 4.